Welcome to Nature Revisited. Nature Revisited would like to announce The Experience of Place, a series of podcasts that will feature people who have a strong relationship to the earth. We will focus on how a deep connection to a place can help shape who we are and how we relate to our natural world. We will be talking with gardeners, farmers, sportsmen, people who experience nature up close and personal. Nature Revisited will periodically be airing this series as we move into our second year, and I hope you will enjoy them. Nature Revisited would also like to start this new feature with a person who inspired it, Mitchell Silver, the commissioner of New York City Parks Department. Mitchell has a deep history with New York and is committed to making it a better place. As commissioner, he works daily at bringing nature and the residents of his city closer together, working so that everyone who either lives there or visits has an experience of place. So you are a gardener, in the sense that you've gardened. I have gardened. You have an interest in the garden. So yes. One of my, the premises I have is that you don't have to have a garden to be a gardener. I mean, this is your garden, isn't this it? Is, well, this is my garden now, yeah. yeah. And here, this rooftop yeah. garden. Yeah. So this so, is the sounds of New York. We're dealing with coyotes today. That's the New York fascination. They're all over the place. Really? Uh, they just found one in Queens uh, on the weekend. They found one in Barry Park City. We found several. This is probably the sixth coyote. Don't know if it's the same one. I don't know if they put something around its neck, but yes, a lot of coyotes. Do they live in the park and then... Or no, they, they come from the north, Westchester County, then they migrate. Then Cortland Park in the Bronx, and now they're migrating south. We can't keep nature out of no, the city. No, we're in their territory. Take us from where you were brought up to where you are today. Give, give a little bit of the history. Wow. Where did life lead you along the way? Well, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, went to high school in New York, college and graduate school. Uh, got involved in architecture and planning. And so always had a love for cities and buildings and maps and the environment. But then I got more passionate about the people that occupied those places and not just the physical side. So my entire career, I got involved in urban planning, mostly in New York, then as a consultant. And that took me ultimately to uh, North Carolina, where I was very active in helping to reshape uh, an entire city, Raleigh, North Carolina. I was there for about 10 years and really helped that city become an emerging city uh, here in the 21st century. And then I was very fortunate to be elected president of the American Planning Association. And that allowed me to travel all over the world uh, and to see how other places plan for their cities and their parks. And then recently, the mayor called me and said, would you like to come back home? Uh, I'm a planner, uh, wasn't actively involved in parks, but when I heard the mayor's challenge about creating a 21st century park system, one that's equitable and different, he had me at hello and I felt it was time to come back. So with my entire career, it's been this great marriage of really understanding the anatomy of cities, but more importantly, the fact of how you plan for people and not just place. And so I have focused my entire career on making sure those two components work together. And uh, that's basically what brought me here. And I'm very, very excited about the future for the park system here in New York City. My mother died when I was very young. But before she passed away, she enrolled my brother and I into the botanical garden, had a gardening program. And so while we wanted to play Little League, my mother uh, enrolled us in this program. We had a little plot of land in the botanical garden in Brooklyn. And every Saturday, we started planting. When we uh, purchased a house in upstate New York, uh, my mother was very much into gardening. And all of us had to take turns uh, tilling the soil, playing the seeds, taking care of the garden. And so for me, uh, maybe because my mother passed on, that those memories are very important to me. But I did enjoy putting my hands in the dirt, uh, feeling what the dirt feels like and crumbling it to know that that's the earth, that it just really provided a memory that really lasted me my entire life. When I owned a house, all those memories start rushing back as I start going through the same you know, processes of making sure you're digging right and that everything is leveled off properly. But just the smell of the dirt 
There's a certain smell to it if you get nice, healthy dirt, uh, particularly in the Northeast, uh, that it just brings back these memories. And so for me, it's quite special. And I know that if a young child has those same experiences, it too will last them a lifetime. In very dense cities like New York, I don't think enough people pay attention to our natural environment. In New York City, we have 29,000 acres of parkland, but 10,000 acres are natural areas. And we're trying to really bring more attention to those natural areas throughout our city, whether it's the wetlands out in various parts, and whether it's in the Bronx, enough people aren't aware of the natural environment. When we take certain people to these locations or show them pictures, the first thing they'll say is that's not New York City. People are taken for granted in natural areas. They believe they have to travel to far distances. And so we certainly want to bring more attention to all the natural resources we have here in New York City. We recognize what gardens do for the, in our opinion, the average citizen. We have botanical gardens, but we have a lot of gardens in many of our parks, our larger parks. And then we just have a lot of people that are invested in planting flowers, our whole gardener team that we have in many, many of our parks. So we understand that for some people, it's a place to relax. It's a place to come out and enjoy the natural beauty. In many of our gardens, they change color throughout the seasons. And so it just gives people a place to relax and to contemplate. Not every park is built for recreation. People go there for family gatherings. People go there to propose to get married. People go there for important community events. But it just gives people a way to walk away from New York City. And I always watch the eyes of a person that comes off of a street and enters a park, and all of a sudden, there are no cars, no bicycles, and you watch their eyes wander, and then when they hit a beautiful garden, you could just see their eyes light up. It's a natural beauty that you just cannot create on your own, and so again, it's just beautiful layers of colors that are just well-maintained and landscaped, and it's really a place where someone can just relax and just enjoy and feel alive. We have, in New York City, close to 1,800 community groups, our partner groups, that are active in parks. We can always tell when a park is cared for by a community group, when they take ownership and love that park. And so we're seeing a lot of success that when we have neighborhood groups involved, they're involved in not just cleaning, but planting and gardening. And you could always walk by a park to know there's a community group involved in this one. And in many cases, it's in partnership with some of our own gardeners in the parks department. So when you have these smaller parks, the community really takes ownership because it's just at the right scale and they pass it almost every day. And so you see this affection they have for the park. And as a result, it translates to the beautiful gardens and how it's just not just maintained, but cared for. For us, I just find that exciting and refreshing. And, and they do as well. What are some other projects that you're particularly proud of that you're working on that we may not know about yet? Well, the one we just kicked off is called Parks Without Borders. It was just mentioned in what was called the One NYC. The mayor released the plan last week. And the Parks Without Borders is a concept that is not just looking at the parks, which covers 14% of the city's footprint, but parks and streets and sidewalks and all the other public spaces, which equates to 40% of the city's public realm. And so Parks Without Borders is taking a fresh look about how we can connect and make these public spaces more seamless because the average citizen won't know when they're work, walking on Parks Department property and then all of a sudden they walk on Department Transportation property. They're just walking. And so we want to plan that way that it's more seamless. We want to remove some of those barriers so people could get to parks a lot easier and not have fences or gates or walls at certain streets start to penetrate it so people have more access to those parks. So it's a great new program to make our streets greener, to bring the park experience out to the sidewalk. And parks should not end at the, at the fence line. It should extend to the street as well. And so we're looking at how we can expand our entire public realm uh, with using parks as the real main feature. It's hard to say if I have a favorite. I try to get a different experience for different parks. So I go to each borough on a weekend and I'll pick a few parks of different scales that I'll go to. And I just want to observe. I want to see how people are experiencing and using the park. Whether you're a senior, a family, a child, an immigrant, a New Yorker, I want to see how people engage with their park. What are they doing? Where are they sitting? Why are they doing what they're doing? But also look at just the quality of the park. And so I can't say I have a favorite spot because parks, the Bronx, for example, 
has an incredible park system when you go there, very similar to what you see here in Central Park. Staten Island has a very different vibe. Brooklyn has a very different experience. And so I don't have a favorite place, but I just love to see how people use the park. Rather than asking them for a survey, I like to watch and observe them. And for me, it helps me uh, plan the parks of the future. So what are some of your goals for the future? The first is that we want to create what I call the 21st century park system. As I see it, there have been several eras of park planning. The first was really the garden movement, is when people started to enjoy the outdoors, the formal gardens we know from Europe, and that basically translated to many of the parks here in the United States. And so they're always a critical element to a lot of our parks, but that was an era really toward the end part of the 19th century. Then the landscape architecture profession arrived. And for the first time, we had people who shaped the landscape. Central Park, Prospect Park, you had the gardens and meadows and trees. Now people can walk and experience the parks. Anyone could. Then we went into the what I call the Robert Moses era of the recreation facilities where every space you can find was packed with recreation. And there are a lot of people that still feel that era is still with us today. And then we get to that post-industrial era, which I call healing the land, where people were now taking untouched land, contaminated land, and creating it into the parks. The big question is, what's next? What happens now in the 21st century? One of the things we're going to focus on is equity. As we look at our park system, we want to make sure that all of our parks, large or small, in all neighborhoods are well cared for, or well maintained, regardless of where you live. So that's something that we're working on here in New York City. Another one is resiliency and sustainability. Post Sandy and with climate change, we're now in a new reality. We can't plan parks the way we used to, particularly on the waterfront or in flood prone areas. And so we're taking a very unique approach on planning for the future, understanding how it needs to be more sustainable, green infrastructure to make sure as we plan for the future, our entire park system is more sustainable. Innovation technology. Uh, I believe that we need to have the analytics and the metrics to assess the health of our park system. As a planner, I like to look at a city and say that I'm basically a doctor of a city to make sure I understand how the city can stay healthy. We're doing the same thing with parks. We want to start building those analytics and metrics to see how we can keep our entire park system healthy. And then finally, it's planning and placemaking, which I'm very excited about. It's really rethinking what do we need from our parks in the 21st century. We have six generations that are living in, at any given time, from greatest to silent to boomer to X, Y, and Z. Each one of those groups experience a park in a very different way. And we can't just plan parks for one user or one group. We have to think very differently. And as we have new generations come, they experience the parks very differently. And so we want to create that 21st century park system that's really based on the experience that people get from the park. And so that's what we're, we plan to do. And, and I'm very excited about that vision going forward. We want the park to be authentic. Yeah. We uh, are very active in community engagement when we plan our parks. We ask all the questions. Uh, and more and more people are saying they want green, more green and natural features in their parks. So that's a refreshing trend. Uh, people want a place, not just a hard surface, but a soft surface, greenery, shade, trees, flowers, where they can sit down and enjoy the park and not just run around and play basketball. So we're seeing that evolution happening, but it needs to be authentic to that community. Things are changing, and so we want to make sure that we understand the demographics of each uh, one of our parks and then plan to make sure we really address uh, those unique characteristics of that community. Kind of using that phrase that a lot of people use these days, and I love it, it's called a sense of place. I, I talk about three things. I talk about sense of place, authenticity of place, experience of place, and memory of place. In terms of memory, I grew up in Prospect Park. I can close my eyes and I can imagine every part of that park. Those memories, if you have a quality park, stays with you for a lifetime. And so it's our job, how do we now create those new memories for present and future generations so that when they grow up, they can have a unique experience. I walked the High Line and I enjoyed it. I went to Central Park, I went to Prospect Park. We wanna make sure they have that unique experience because with me, it stayed with me for a lifetime and I'm sure if we do it right, it will stay with those next generations for a lifetime as well. So to me, memory of place, sense of place, authenticity, all those things are vitally important to what we call really creating that unique experience. Are you optimistic that, that young people and the society is going in the right direction? I believe we are going in the right direction. As we urbanize, we recognize the importance of open space. Density and open space go together. 
if I imagine a world like New York City where there were no parks. We need parks, it makes us feel alive. It gives us that sense of place. It gives us a place where our brains can just relax and take a break and enjoy the natural beauty. So as we urbanize, uh, we constantly hear, if you're gonna put more density, you must put more open space. When we work with young children, uh, we have a lot of programs where they can help plant trees or plant flowers. To see their hands in the dirt and to feel it, makes them feel very connected with nature. And you can see the glow in their eyes. We have a lot of projects. We have young people, while they, either they plant flowers or help us plant trees, and you gotta see the incitement in their eyes. They're not gonna forget that. And I'm sure the next time they walk by and see some flowers, they're gonna have that connection to say, I know exactly what went into that. You know, I earned home and I had to do a lot of gardening, so I know what it feels like. The dirt has a smell to it. Occasionally you'll see a worm. You start to see nature beneath the ground. You know, that leaves an impact on the child. So in my opinion, uh, as we go forward, people are gonna appreciate nature even more. And you can even tell from New York City. I mean, there are crowds of people. They love our parks. They come there weekends, nights, winter time. This is a place where people come just to feel alive. People come up to me, Prospect Park, Fort Greene Park, lesser known parks, St. Mary's, of course, Central Park. There are so many parks that people have a different experience when they go there. Brooklyn Bridge, they enjoy the views. People just say they love the parks. And they say, keep doing what you're doing. We love the parks. We, and, and that's why they actually come to New York. They'll go to the theater, but they'll find their way to Central Park or the High Line. And they actually, you know, when you look at the Twitter feeds and social media, it's just filled with everyone saying wonderful things about our parks here in New York City. Is the High Line become too successful? No park could ever be too successful. Uh, the High Line, no question, is successful. It is not only a park that provides placemaking, but it also provides space making. You're traveling through space, through buildings. And as I watch people walk down this park, whether it's the sculpture or the gardens, but it's the views. There, there are so many places you can take a picture and experience it brand new for the first time that to me, that's part of the charm that you have international tourists, you have New Yorkers, you have others just coming there and just enjoying this incredible walk through space. That is a park. It's transformed the district. It's taken this old abandoned railroad and converted into one of the world's best parks. So it's absolutely a success. And to me, you cannot be successful enough. To know that people are now caring for land, we have a program called uh, Green Thumb. We have over 600 community gardens. Some are for vegetables, some are for just normal horticulture, for flowers. To see this movement, which has been around in New York City, to take off right now, it's so refreshing. It's, we have a different generation that understands nature and the environment very differently. And so for me, it's just very refreshing that we have this purpose-filled generation that understands how important the land is and not taking it for granted. It's not just a commodity that you buy or sell, but it's something you have to respect and cherish. So I'm very moved by the new generation that we're seeing record numbers of young people getting involved in urban farming, reclaiming vacant land and converting it to a productive use. And now they're teaching the next generation to do the same. It's, it's quite moving. And we now have all these stewards and partners that we never had before, and it's growing. Uh, we're constantly getting more requests for more people to reclaim the land and really put it toward productive use. And gardening tends to be that common thread that brings all these groups together. So for me personally, it's so refreshing to see that people love and cherish the land because sometimes it needs to be reclaimed, sometimes it needs to be restored, and sometimes it needs to be loved. And we're seeing all those things happening. If we don't have a better relationship with the natural world as a species, we're doomed. I agree. Uh, as we see more and more development, the natural landscape provides so many benefits to how we're going to grow as a species. Clean air, clean water, clean land. We have got to learn how to respect and retain the quality of our natural resources. Uh, otherwise, it's going to take decades to restore it. The Hudson River, a polluted water body, and after a concerted effort of us focusing on it, what do we do to keep it clean? People can now swim in the Hudson River. There are fish back in that habitat that was gone a long time ago, that if we want to be a better civilization as we move forward, we've got to take care of our natural environment. It's not if, we just must. Anything you would kind of like to share either about your city, 
about yourself, about nature, about gardens? Well, one of the messages that I've been sharing with my staff and with residents of the city is that one of our roles at parks is to build and maintain. And the more I think about that word maintain, I feel it doesn't do justice to what we have to do for our parks. While we should maintain, that is a checklist approach to doing things, but to me the word care is a lot more important. To me, caring for our natural resources comes from a different part of the soul. It's not just going through a checklist. And so one of my messages is I'm trying to get the public not just to see us and help us maintain, but to also care for our parks. And we see it. We see it among our employees. We see it among all these community groups that choose to take their time to go to that park and help love and care for that park. That is what we want to see more of. If we want to have a healthy city, if we want to have a healthy natural environment, healthy parks, we've got to maintain our parks, but more importantly, we have to start caring for our parks. And that is the one message that I'm trying to get across, that once we collectively care for our parks, we'll be able to continue to have the best park system in the world. enjoyed my conversation with Mitchell Silver. The interview was recorded on the roof of the Arsenal building in New York City. If you did enjoy this episode, please share with family, friends, and colleagues. And do subscribe to Nature Revisited on your podcast server. You can always follow us on Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube. And Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Orden and Charles Gagan. If you would like to support us or share your ideas and suggestions, please visit NordenProductions.com. That's Norden, N-O-O-R-D-E-N, Productions.com. I hope you will join us for the next edition of Nature Revisited. And until then, do remember, we are nature. Nature.